Hello, and welcome to another video lesson intended to provide you important principles and fundamental concepts in the study of communication. This is going to be the first of a three-part series that looks at three fundamental models of communication, ways of theoretically understanding how the dynamic process of communication actually operates. And each of these models is going to have its distinct advantages for being able to explain how certain kinds of communication work. However, what you're also going to see over the course of these three videos is that these models also have potential limitations that keep them from being a complete representation of how communication might operate in any given circumstance. The first of these three models that we're going to look at is what's referred to as a transmission model of communication. Now, while all of these theories of communication were really developed in the middle to later part of the 20th century, when we're thinking about the transmission model of communication, the origins actually go back just a bit further to the tradition of rhetoric in classical Greece and Rome. Back in ancient Greece, we have the development of an entire art, quasi-science, and educational field that became known as rhetoric. Rhetoric, very basically understood, is the practice of persuasive communication. And Aristotle's formulation of rhetoric in his treatise on rhetoric, uh, approximately the 4th century BCE, provides one of the most influential ways of thinking about how communication operates and is taught, uh, particularly in high schools and colleges, not only in public speaking, but also in English composition. Aristotle's rhetoric talks about how someone who's looking to persuade an audience needs to come up with certain messages that involve different kinds of content and persuasive appeals, talked about how to structure those messages, uh, add linguistic style to them, and ultimately be able to deliver them to an audience. And this way of understanding persuasive speaking from a speaker to an audience actually informed the work of a couple of scientists who were especially interested in the development of electric and electronic communication in the 19th and 20th centuries. Shannon and Weaver's seminal article in 1949 stemmed from work that they did trying to understand the power of mass media. Telegraph communication, which had been a thing since the 19th century, taught us that we can send messages from point A to point B literally across entire continents and eventually even cross oceans uh, to another continent. That's a powerful form of communication. And then the development of radio in the early 20th century showed the power of transmitting messages from a single source to a huge number of people in ways that was amazingly influential. So Shannon and Weaver wanted to try to figure out how they could develop a theoretical model that accounted for the important variables and to basically explain how this process works. And this is what became known as the transmission model of communication. It works essentially like this. Any sort of communication is going to originate from a source. In this case, we've got a young musician laying down some tracks because he wants to share his music with the world. Now, what the source is going to do with their thoughts, their ideas, the things that they want to convey to their audience, what the source is going to do is what we refer to as encoding a message. They're going to take the thoughts and the ideas and they put them into a form that eventually an audience is going to be able to process and understand. Uh, in a previous video in this series, we uh, define communication as the sharing of meaning. Uh, through the use of signs and symbols. And so in putting together a piece of music that involves lyrics as well as uh, the artistic use of sound, it encodes a message that may be interpreted by somebody else. The message then is what's being transmitted to some other source. The message is going to be sent through what we refer to as a channel. Channel, basically speaking, is the means by which a message gets from one point to another. Now, in some cases, when we're talking about the sharing of musical messages, we might have a musician on stage performing before a live audience, and that channel could be the voice of the musician, uh, the use of the instruments, and uh, any kind of uh, amplification uh, technology that's used to get 
the songs to the audience. And so in some ways, the channel involves things like the airwaves uh, that bring the light of the uh, images of the musician, uh, their facial expressions, uh, their gestures, as well as the sound waves of the singing and rapping generating from the singer. That's how it gets to the audience. But when we're talking about channels that involve some kind of technology, we often refer to that as medium. So you might imagine in this particular case, the medium that this source is going to rely on is the use of digital music technology. Uh, after laying down this track, it's going to be digitized. It's going to be uploaded to internet networks that are going to be available eventually to be downloaded and accessed by a receiver. In this case, this little champ who's just loving the music that he's hearing. What the receiver is going to do once they receive the message from the channel is as you can probably guess, engage in decoding the message, taking the lyrics and the music and everything that's coming through those headphones and in their mind, doing some interpreting, trying to figure out what it is that the source is trying to convey through the lyrics, through the music and so forth. So a source encodes a message and the receiver then is going to decode the message. Now, nothing's ever perfect in communication, as you could probably imagine, which is where the concept of noise comes in. Quite literally, Shannon and Weaver are thinking about noise as anything that might potentially disrupt uh, the transmission of the information from one point to another point. So they're especially interested in things like radio and telegraph. So what kinds of things might cause interference in the signal or otherwise somehow disrupt what's being sent from the source to the receiver. Now, there are other kinds of noise besides just interference with the medium or something going on in the channel that's disruptive. In future videos in this series, we can talk a little bit more about what some of that kind of noise might be. But you can imagine then that this transmission model is relatively simple and brings with it a few assumptions about how communication works. First of all, this model presumes that communication is unilateral. In other words, it's one way. It moves from source to receiver. And that's the way we think about the flow. Now, closely related to that is a second assumption, and that is if communication is only unilateral, then communication is also asymmetric. In other words, the amount of power and influence involved in how the communication episode works is really focused primarily on the source. The receiver of the message is literally just a passive recipient. The source decides what's being communicated, how, where, and when it's being communicated, and all the receiver has to do is take it in. Now, you might already be thinking to yourself that the process of decoding brings in some aspect of audience activity into this process. And you'd be right about that. And we need to interrogate this idea a little bit further in subsequent videos in this series. The, the final assumption regarding the transmission model is that communication is not only unilateral and asymmetric, but in the way that Shannon and Weaver are thinking about it, communication is primarily understood as information flow. Very simply speaking, information was defined in this context as anything that reduces uncertainty. So if a source is providing some kind of factual information that leads the receiver to understand things a little bit better afterwards so that they were less uncertain at the end of the communication than they were at the start of the communication about whatever it is they were uncertain about. That's what effective communication actually involves. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, but communication isn't simply just about information. And you'd be right. And subsequent videos in the series are going to interrogate this idea as well. But you don't necessarily have to get esoteric about wondering about it, whether communication is simply information in order to start finding some limitations in this model. We can very easily point out a very key limitation with another brief example. Let's say in this instance, the source is somebody who is writing a paper of uh, say writing an essay for class. And so as you're writing the essay for my class, let's say you are encoding a message. You're taking your ideas that you developed from your research and your imagination and you are putting them down metaphorically speaking, perhaps on paper, the message that you're going to transmit through the channel is really only going to be able to be done through some kind of technological medium. 
whether it's going to be a hard copy paper with printed ink on it that contains the various words and paragraphs and sentences that contain your message, or whether you're going to be sending it through an electronic medium, uh, such as uploading a file to Canvas. In any event, you're going to write that paper, you're going to send it to me, the receiver, who's going to be in charge of decoding the message because that's the whole reason why you're writing this essay as an assignment for class, right? Is somehow I need to be able to read and understand what you've written. But we have to ask ourselves, is that where the communication ends? Now, you already know from your experience that this is not where the communication ends at this point, because most folks that are like me that receive student papers are going to be grading those papers, right? And what's the purpose of grading and what happens to the message after I get my grubby little hands all over it? Well, we're going to need to wait until the next video to find out because the transmission model of communication that assumes that communication is unilateral and asymmetric and just involves information flow from one point to another point doesn't give us the explanation that we need. Okay, so if you've got any questions at all about the transmission model, please don't hesitate to let me know. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next video to see how we can improve on this model just a little bit.